We're now going to talk about a counterpart to the final value theorem called the initial value theorem. And whereas the final value theorem let you predict uh, the long term behavior of a signal based on properties of its Laplace transform, the initial value theorem does the opposite. It allows you to say things about the initial values um, based on things about the Laplace transform. Um, but to sort of uh, set the scene and motivate things a little bit, suppose we're cycling upon a road and we come to a junction and we want to turn right. So you're sitting there on your bike, you're cycling along, you've got your hands on the handlebars. What happens? You just turn to the right, right? Wrong. In fact, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but when you're cycling along and you want to make a right turn, in fact, just before you make the right turn, you make a very subtle left-hand turn and then you start to turn right. And if you don't believe me, um, I've included uh, some uh, videos showing this happening. Um, and, but maybe next time you're cycling, just have a look uh, and try and really micro-analyze what's uh, going on when you make a turn. Um, and what we want to do is try to explain this with the initial value theorem. And I'm going to sort of set that as a little bit of a, a, a challenge for you. But um, just to sort of sketch out in a little bit more detail the phenomena that we're talking about here. Um, suppose we've got uh, time on this axis here. And um, what we're doing is on our bike, uh, we're driving along and then we want, we suddenly decide, ah, I want to turn right. So we have some new reference value. So here we're going to have like the theta is given, going to be sort of the heading angle of the bike. So this going along this road, this is theta is equal to zero. And then theta turns by uh, 90 degrees for a right turn. So maybe we've got uh, pi over two here. So this is our reference um, trajectory. And the claim is, on your bike, what happens is that you're going along, you're going along straight, 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 straight. Want to turn one right, want to turn right. Oh, I go slightly left, and then I go up, and eventually I go right again. And we would we sort of got the tools to describe this uh, long-term behavior. Um, not y, theta of t. Um, the final value theorem could be used to explore and try and understand this long-term behavior. And we're going to be focusing in on this initial behavior using the initial value theorem. Um, so what is the initial value theorem? So we're going to start slightly differently to the final value theorem. And we're just going to look at the Laplace transform of some signal y. So what is uh, that? That's just the integral from 0 to infinity of y of t e to the minus st dt. OK, and um, I'm just going to change things ever so slightly. I'm going to multiply this by s. So nothing too dodgy so far. Um, now what am I going to do? I'm going to make a change of variables. So I'm going to say that um, I'm going to say invent a new variable tau, and it's going to be equal to st. And I'm just going to substitute that in and see what happens. And so this integral now becomes 0 to infinity. And I'm going to have s, y, and then um, t is equal to tau over s. e to the minus st is e to the minus tau. And dt, s is just a constant here. So dt is d tau over s. And now you see the motivation for putting in this multiplication factor here. These s's cancel out. OK, we haven't really done anything so far. We've just sort of done a bit of algebra. Um, but now what I want you to think about is what happens when we make s very, very large. In, in particular, what's going to happen to this integral here? So let's just draw a little picture of what's sort of going on. And let's suppose, yeah, so here we've got time. Uh, well, let's call it tau, actually, because it's in our new variable. Um, and suppose that this is this thing here. This is y of tau over 
1. So we're setting s equal to 1, um, and this is what y of tau looks like. e to the minus s, t, uh, so e, yeah, e to the minus tau, that just looks like that. So that's e to the minus tau, and so the product of these two looks like, for, for small values of tau, it looks like y of tau over s, and then for large values of tau, um, it looks like uh, it, it collapses down to, to zero. And now what happens when we make s larger? Well, if this is what y of tau over 1 looks like, then y of tau over 2, it just looks like stretching out uh, the axis. Tau has to get twice as large um, for you to output the same number. So y of tau over 1 looks like this, y of tau over 2 looks maybe more like this, and then all of that happens at much higher values of tau. And the, the key thing to notice here is that we're getting more and more, um, it looks more and more like y of 0 in this region where e to the minus tau is big. So all of the other stuff is getting pushed to values where tau is large, and the effect of multiplying it by e to the minus tau is for those values to get collapsed down. So the claim here is that as we make s very, very large, y of tau over s e to the minus tau is approximately equal to y of 0 e to the minus tau. So as we make s very, very large, this approximation gets better and better and better. And the implication of that is, if I can find one of my pens that works, is that this thing here is approximately equal to the integral 0 to infinity y of 0 e to the minus tau d tau. And this you can easily just check is equal to y of 0. And this approximation gets bit better and better and better as s gets larger and larger and larger. And in fact, in the limit, as s goes to infinity, we get inequality. And um, you can make this uh, argument rigorous just by splitting this integral into two pieces. And um, uh, I'll give you a link, or you can try and do it yourself. Um, but what we've shown at the end of all of this is that the limit as s goes to infinity of s y of s. So yeah, we, we've taken the limit as s goes to infinity of this whole expression um, is equal to y of 0. And this thing here, this is the initial value theorem. Um, so the question is, what on earth has this got to do with bicycles and counter-steering behavior? And the bottom line is that it comes down to um, the fact that systems with right half plane zeros will always exhibit this behavior of turning the wrong way. And the sort of challenge that I want you to think about is how we could explain this with the final value theorem. So what's going on? The claim is that we have some process which has a right half plane zero. And what does that mean? It means in the numerator, we have something that looks like um, z minus s. And then we have some other um, transfer function. Let's call it p of s. So this is our process. And so this is describing the dynamics of our bike. So the form of our, the transfer function of our bike is z minus s multiplied by some other transfer function, p of s. And then no matter what we do with our control system, and so the output of this is the heading of the bike, theta. This is what we're doing to the handlebars. Our control system is us in this case. Um, it decides what to do based on the difference. So we decide what we want to do with our controller based on the difference between where we want the bike to go and where the bike is actually going. So we should put a, a minus one in here for negative feedback. So we measure the angular position of the bike 
we compare it to our reference, we decide what we want to do with our control system. And the claim is that no matter what we do, provided that this is a stable closed loop transfer function, we'll always have this effect of going the wrong way before going the right way. And so a little puzzle uh, for you, first of all, what does our controller need to have in order for us to be able to track this reference? So what you need to show there is that the controller has to have an integrator in it. Um, so the controller has to be the form on the form 1 over s multiplied by some other transfer function c1 of s in order for the long-term behavior to be uh, OK. And you can explain that with the final value theorem. And now, using the initial value theorem, show that provided you have such a controller, you will always initially go the wrong way before going the right way. So we're putting in a reference signal as a step. We can find out what this transfer function is here and um, the transfer function from r to theta is, and just by having a z minus s in the numerator of the plant transfer function, it'll be enough to show that we're going the wrong way. And the hint here is, so what characteristic of signals shows that they're going the wrong way? Uh, so the initial condition here, the initial value is zero, um, but maybe the derivative of the initial value is pointing the wrong way or maybe the higher order derivatives of the initial, uh, the initial value is going the wrong way. So the hint to understanding this um, is look at theta dot of zero, theta double dot of zero, and so on. And what you'll find is that as long as you look at a high enough derivative um, of theta this z here, um, so the, this z minus s here, will be enough to show that in response to a step input r, theta dot or theta double dot of zero, one of the, a whole bunch of them will be zero, but eventually you look high enough and you find one that's negative. And that means that the initial curvature of theta is pointing the wrong way, so we have to go down and then we'll come back up again. Um, so. It's a little challenge for you to do, and uh, on the way we got an introduction to the, the initial value theorem, which is this thing here, which was the main purpose of the 